This is the first lesson of multivariable calculus. And what I wanted to let you know on these videos is that I'm going to try to keep them as short as I can. Um, for instance, today you'll probably find this one to be pretty quick. But what I'm going to do as I go through the notes on these videos a lot of times is when I get to the examples, just like I would do in class, I'm going to stop and give you a chance to work through the examples that are in the notes. And then what I'm going to ask you to do at those points is I'm going to ask you to pause the video, work through the example, and then unpause the video so that you can check your work and make sure that you're on the right track. So a lot of this, um, in addition to me going through all of the information that is in the lesson or lessons that we're going to cover, a lot of this is also an opportunity for you to do a little bit of guided practice um, outside of the synchronous time that we have in class. So keep that in mind as you work through this. It's not just a matter of, you know, kind of passively sitting by watching the video. I really want you to be actively engaged in what's going on with these videos as you watch them. So to start with, um, today what we're going to do is we're going to start on the first unit of this course. And the first unit of this course actually covers a lot of material that um, really is an extension of things that we do in AP Calculus BC. Now with the pandemic starting and the way that school ended last year, the people who um, were in AP Calculus BC last year, you missed out on the unit that we normally do at the end of the year, which covers um, calculus with parametric equations, calculus with two-dimensional vectors, and calculus with polar equations. So this first unit that we're going to cover we're going to go through it pretty fast, but what you're going to find is um, this stuff is pretty simple. Everybody has seen parametric equations and polar equations and 2D vectors back in pre-calculus. For some of you, that's been a couple of years, um, so you might be a little bit rusty, but you'll find as you work through this, this stuff is fairly simple. Now, normally, what I'm going to do with these warm-ups that are on the notes that I have is I'm going to work through these with you during our synchronous time. But since this is the first lesson and we um, will not have time to cover this one, when we get to the second day of class, we'll actually go through the warm up for the next set of notes. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the idea behind some of this stuff that we're going to do. And really, more than anything, I need you to work through the examples. And I need you to read through the book and make sure that you're understanding this stuff because what we do in this first unit, especially as it pertains to parametric equations and vectors, that is the basis for just about everything that we're going to do in this course. So keep that in mind, even though it's simple, we're going to build this into three dimensional models eventually. And that's where the multivariable calculus is going to come into play. So for this first warm up. Um, what I want you to do is take a minute and see if you can remember how this stuff works from pre-calculus. What it's asking you to do here is eliminate the parameter and then figure out what the sketch would look like. So go ahead and pause the video, give yourself a couple of minutes to work through that, and then when you feel like you have a solution, uh, unpause the video and you can check your answer. Okay, so here's what you should have ended up with. Um, if you were completely stuck, you could have always gone through on your calculator and you could have graphed this in parametric mode on your calculator. We'll go through that in a little while. Um, but the main thing here is when you're dealing in parametric equations, um, there is a relationship between the X and the Y and the R value. So um, what I've got is X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. And what that's going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to eliminate the parameter. The T is the parameter. And when we do that, this whole thing, instead of X squared plus Y squared is R squared, becomes cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1, using your Pythagorean identity. And that means R squared is 1, or R is equal to 1. Um, we also have a, a T interval from 0 to 1. So that tells me this is just going to be a semicircle. It's starting at the point one zero, going counterclockwise around the origin. Um, so fairly simple, but that's something that you may be completely rusty on. And if you tried that and you were totally stuck, don't worry about it. As we go through these first couple of sections, you'll find that this stuff will come back pretty quickly. Okay, so our focus today is on, first of all, just reviewing parametric equations. And then secondly, 
doing a little bit of calculus with parametric equations. So as a reminder, when we're talking about parametric equations, what we're talking about is dealing with the X and the Y in whatever scenario that we're working with. We're dealing with those independently. So by introducing this parameter T, now I can work with X and Y on their own. Okay, so as a review, let's talk about graphing with parametric equations. In order to graph with a set of parametric equations, we have to have T values for the X and for the Y, and that's what's gonna generate our ordered pairs. So if you look down below here, I've got an example for you. It says, sketch the trajectory over the time interval zero to 10 of the particle whose parametric equations of motion are given by X is T minus three sine T and Y is equal to four minus three cosine T. Now, generating the table is very, very simple. All I'm gonna do is for each time value or each T value, I'm, I'm often gonna say time instead of T because typically our parameter T is gonna be time. So if I slip up and say time, realize it's because 99% of the time when we're using the parameter T, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna represent time. Okay, so um, when you find these ordered pairs, all you have to do is plug in the T value into the X and the Y equations, get your corresponding ordered pair. And to generate that table is very simple. And then you just plot the points. Now, what's a little bit different here than what you would normally see by creating an XY chart if we were just dealing in you know, typical rectangular coordinates without the parameter, is that we get a little bit more information. Not only do we have the points, but we also have the direction of motion that's associated with this scenario that we're looking at. So if we're thinking of this as motion over time, you can see what's happening um, in the X direction and in the Y direction independently, but also in addition to that on my graph, I'm indicating which, which direction um, this thing would be, would be moving. So let's say this is a particle and it's particle motion. You can see that the motion is then described by the graph, not just the shape, but also by the arrows that are there. Okay, so a um, couple of things about this. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to graphing in just a minute. I'll show you how to do that on the calculator if you haven't done that before, if you don't remember how to do that. So one of the things that you're going to see a lot of in your assignment is going to be going back and forth between parametric equations and then eliminating that parameter and just having sort of your standard rectangular setup where you have y in terms of x so to eliminate the parameter just means that we're trying to eliminate the t and if you notice here we've got a set of parametric equations and these parametric equations um, what we're trying to do is rewrite this so then we have it in sort of a standard rectangular form. And the easiest way to do this when you have equations like this is you just wanna see if you can isolate T in one of the equations. And you notice with the second equation, we could get T is equal to Y minus one. And then what we're gonna do is just substitute that Y minus one in for T into the X equation. And now we've got X in terms of Y. Okay, so fairly simple to do. Sometimes eliminating the parameter can be a little bit tricky. So keep that in mind, it's not always gonna be that straightforward. Sometimes we've gotta be a little bit more creative like with the warmup where we can use our Pythagorean, Pythagorean identity knowing that you know x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared and r being the distance from the origin. And then from there, we can eliminate that parameter and figure out what the graph's gonna look like. Okay, so um, what I'm looking at here is a set of parametric equations um, X is cosine T, Y is sine T. And what I know is that um, cosine squared plus sine squared is one. We saw that on the warm up question. So, what I want you to try to do here is I want you to try to eliminate the parameter on both sets of equations. So, go ahead and do that. And then, in addition to that, see if you can come up with the graph. Because even though you're going to see that the result for these is the same, um, in terms of what the graph looks like in the end, there's actually some different information coming out of the parametric equations. So take a, take a couple of minutes, try to eliminate the parameter and graph. Um, so pause the video and do that. And then when you're done, come back and um, we can check over the answers. Okay, so what you should have found 
um, if you eliminate the parameter here is you get x squared plus y squared is r squared. And that means cosine squared plus sine squared is r squared or r is equal to one. And for the second one, sine squared plus cosine squared is r squared or again, r is equal to one. So this r is equal to one sort of um, gets you into a little bit of the idea of polar equations. So if you remember your polar equations, r being equal to one is just the distance that we are from the origin, which is referred to as the pole when we're working in polar coordinates. So when we graph this, you'll see that even though these two results look the same, it's actually two different scenarios. If we think of this as particle motion again, you'll notice that you actually have two entirely different things going on. The end result of the path looks the same, but you have to pay attention to what's happening as that path is being created. So I'm gonna show you this on the calculator um, just so everybody is aware of how to graph these things. So what I did is I went ahead and I changed the mode on my calculator. So this is my TI-84. I hit the mode button, went down to the fifth line and you can see where it says function, parametric, polar, and then sequential. I changed it to parametric because we're graphing in parametric mode. Um, I also am going to adjust my window. So in this case, they gave us the parameters for T. Um, it says that T has to be restricted to zero to two pi. And then as far as the T step goes, T step is how often the calculator is going to evaluate these equations for a given T value. So usually you can go with the defaulted value there. 0.1 is a pretty good size. If you make the t value too big, what's going to happen is the calculator is not going to graph enough points and it's not going to look like a smooth curve. So keep in mind, the calculator is not actually graphing the curve. The, act, the calculator is approximating the curve by plotting a bunch of points and connecting them together. OK, so in my y equals uh, menu here, you'll notice that it no longer says y equals because I'm in parametric mode. I've got x equals and I've got y equals. I've got my first set of parametric equations, cosine t, sine t. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and graph that. Notice over here to the left of where it says x equals, I've got um, a little bit different um, graph set up. So if I select that and hit enter, I can choose the color if you've got a color calculator. If you don't, it's not a big deal. But what's more important is where it says line. So what I'm choosing is the one that's going to show me the path. And this, the open circle, I can sort of think of as my particle. And then it's going to leave a trail behind it as it creates that curve. So with my window, um, let me get out of this. Okay, so with my window, I am going to just graph this. And mine's already set up to where I got a nice looking circle. Now, what you might see on yours is when you first graph it, if you're on the standard window, it's gonna sort of look like this because the calculator doesn't have the X and the Y being equal distances in terms of how far it is for one unit. So what you can do if you graphed it like that is you can zoom in, first of all, I wanna zoom in on the origin just to get a little bit better view of this. That's still gonna give me sort of an elliptical shape. And then I can do a zoom square. And by doing zoom square, it's going to even out um, the scale on the x-axis and the y-axis. So one unit is the same distance on both. So notice that the circle where it started, it started at the point one zero and it went counterclockwise around the origin and it completed one cycle. So that's the important thing to notice about the different scenarios, where it started, what direction it went, and how many cycles did it complete. So now I've got my second set of parametric equations. And I already entered it in here, but if I hit enter, that'll turn that one on so that we can graph it. And now when I graph it, I want you to compare where does this graph start, which direction does it go, and how many cycles does it complete? So when I graph this, you can see that now it started at the point zero one, it went clockwise around the origin, and it completed two cycles. If that moves too fast and you want to slow it down a little bit, you can make the calculator plot more points. It'll slow the calculator down. So for example, I could do um, 0 0.05 as my T-step. And now when I graph it, it'll go a little slower. Here's my first graph going counterclockwise, starting at one zero, completing one cycle. 
And then for the second graph, you can see it starts at zero one. It's going clockwise around the same path, but it's gonna create two cycles of this. So the same set, or excuse me, two different sets of parametric equations are producing the same end result graph. So if you just look at the final result, you would say, oh, they look the same. But the reality is they're not the same. They're showing very different information. So you've got to be careful when you're dealing with parametric equations and when you graph them. That's why we typically put the arrows in there um, because we want to make sure that we're showing exactly what's going on when we create those. Okay, so notice that we have the same shape but different motion. Okay, so let's move on and talk a little bit about one other thing that's going to show up within this section. When you go through the homework, they're probably going to refer to something called a cycloid. And a cycloid is just basically um, a set of parametric equations that model this scenario. So if I were to have a point on a circle and roll that circle, if I were to graph the location of where that point goes as that circle rotates, that's basically what's happening here. As I rotate along the x-axis, you can see that point is at different places on the circle. It goes you know, to the left-hand side, to the top, to the right-hand side, to the bottom, and so on as that thing's rotating. And if I trace the path of where that point actually is, it creates this graph called a cycloid. So just keep that in mind. This is the standard equation for a cycloid. It's not something you have to remember. I just wanted you to understand what it was when you come across it in the homework. If they ask you to graph it or if they ask you any information about it, here's the standard setup for it, and that'll help you work through those problems. Okay, so let's move on to the part that really is the new stuff that we're going to talk about. And this is actually doing calculus with parametric curves. And again, had we had the entire year last year in BC Calculus, we actually would have talked about all of this stuff. But since we didn't have that, um, we're going to go through this just a little bit, but you'll see that this is very, very simple. So when we're dealing with parametric curves and we want to take derivatives, we can get derivatives with respect to time. We can get dx dt and dy dt, but a lot of times we also want to get information like dy dx, like we would normally with just rectangular coordinates. Well, to find dy dx, what I have to do is do a little bit of differential um, algebra here. And with my differential algebra, what you'll notice right here, to find dy dx, I'm doing dy dt divided by dx dt. If you were to take that denominator, the dx dt, and flip it and multiply, you'd see the dt's cancel out, and that gives me dy dx. Okay, so that's how I find the slope of a tangent line if, I've given param if I'm given parametric equations. Notice that dx dt is equal to zero. That's going to make that undefined which we know what an undefined slope looks like. Okay, same thing with horizontal tangents and vertical tangents. I can tell where those are based on the dy dt or the dx dt being zero. So if I have dy dt as zero and dx dt is not zero, that's gonna give me a zero slope. So looking at you know this being zero, this not being zero, I would have a non, excuse me, this being the numerator being zero and the denominator not being zero, that would give me zero divided by a non zero number, which would give me a zero dy dx or horizontal tangent. If I have an undefined slope, that means I have to have a non zero number divided by a zero. So you can see dy dt is not zero in that case, dx dt is zero. Now, where this is a little bit tricky is like it says here, what if both of them are zero? Well, if both of them are zero, I'm going to get zero over zero, which would be an indeterminate form, which we've talked a little bit about when we did L'Hopital's rule. But in terms of the context of a graph that you're going to see in parametric, when you see a zero over zero, that's typically going to be a cusp in your graph. So keep that in mind. If both are zero over zero, it's typically going to be a cusp. Okay, so um, where this is a little bit trickier is when we want to find second derivatives. Second derivative, d squared y dx squared. Remember, that has to do with the concavity of my graph when I'm graphing in the standard rectangular form, you know, y equals a function of x. So to find this, it's not as simple as getting the second derivatives of the x and the second derivative of the y and dividing. 
what I have to do is some differential work again. So I want to get the derivative with respect to x of dy dx. But remember from up above, dy dx was in terms of dy dt and dx dt. So I have to take the derivative with respect to x of dy dt over dx dt. So really what I'm doing is the derivative with respect to t divided by dx dt, and it's the derivative with respect to t of dy dx. Now again, notice what would happen here. If I flipped that dx dt and I multiplied, what I would end up with is d dx of dy dx. So what it says over here, this is what you absolutely do not want to do. You don't want to get the second derivative of the y with respect to time and the second derivative of x with respect to time. That's not going to give you the derivative that you're looking for. You've got to take the derivative of dy dx, which should be in terms of t if you're dealing with parametric equations, take the derivative of that with respect to t, and then divide by dx dt. Your book goes through that a little bit more in detail if you want to look at the actual calculations, but that's really the end result of it. It's fairly simple once you stop and think about it a little bit, how with the differential expressions, you're not getting d squared y dx squared if you do the one that I have circled here. Okay, so let's take a look at analyzing some graphs. And I'm going to have you try this using those setups that I showed you for dy dx and for d squared y dx squared or the second derivative. So they're going to ask you equations, uh, excuse me, questions about getting dy dx uh, and the second derivative at two different points. And then we've got a graph here so you can kind of look at your results and see if they make sense. So I want you to pause the video, try to find all of those values, and then check on your graph that those are, in fact, the values that make sense based on what that graph looks like. Okay, so here's what you should have ended up with for dy dx. It's just dy dt, which is 3t squared divided by dx dt, which is 2t. When you divide that out, you get 3 halves t. When you get the second derivative, now we have to get the derivative of our dy dx with respect to t, which is 3 halves, divided by our dx dt, which was 2t, and that gives me 3 over 4t. So for any t value, which again, typically time, for any time value, I can find my tangent slope and I can find my concavity just by plugging the t now into those equations. And that's what they asked you to do. They asked you to find dy dx uh, at t is equal to one, dy dx at t equals negative one. And you can see on your graph, um, when t is equal to one, I'd be at the point one, one. You can see that I have a positive slope and it looks like the slope is about three halves. When I'm at t equals negative one, that would give me the point one, negative one. And to get the coordinate, all I'm doing is I'm plugging into these two equations, the t value. So now I'm looking at the graph, you know, this point right here at one negative one, and I can see my slope should be negative. Okay, so same thing with the concavity. You can see that for t equals one, that's the point one one, I see a value of three fourths, which is indicating the graph should be concave up. At t equals negative one, I'm seeing negative three fourths, which indicates the graph should be concave down. And you can see on the two sections of this graph, when t was one, I'm concave up. And then on this section of the graph, when t was negative one, I'm concave down. So that's what I'm expecting to see. So dealing with parametric equations, we can get the same information that we were getting before. We typically don't want to get the same information that we were getting before because we can get more information now than we were. But it's more, it's another way of going about getting the information that we're accustomed to, even when we're in a parametric form. So the question says, why do you think this is called a semi-cubical parabola? So if you look at the equations, we've got a t squared and a t cubed in there. So it's like we've got part of this is being described in a parabolic way, and part of it is being described in a cubic way. So that's why it's typically referred to as a semi-cubical parabola. Okay, so let's take a look at just a couple more things here. Now that we've talked about a little bit of calculus with this, now we're gonna go back to some of the same applications we were doing back in Calculus BC with just our standard rectangular equations, y in terms of x or x in terms of y. And we're gonna do areas 
and we're going to talk about um, surface area and arc length as well. So to find an area, we're still thinking about the same thing. We're adding up a bunch of rectangles. To reference those rectangles, notice that, remember, we're doing the base times the height in this area setup that I have here. The dx is like the base of my rectangle. The f of x is like the height of my rectangle. And then the integral is going to add all those rectangles together. Well, with parametric equations, to reference those uh, heights and bases, I'm going to have to reference them in a little bit different way. So the height is still you know, f of x or the y. So I can just substitute straight in. You can see this is the setup that we're using. We've got these parametric equations. So my y is just going to be whatever that you know, y equation is. So I'm going to substitute the equation in terms of t in for y. And now for the dx, that's the part that's a little bit tricky. I'm going to do this over here. If I did dx dt, that would give me f prime of t. Well, if you solve for dx, dx is equal to f prime of t dt. So all we're doing is a straight substitution. We're substituting in for dx. We're going to take this expression, um, f prime of t dt, and we're going to plug it in for that dx, and that's where this equation comes from. So it's very easy to derive if you need to find one of these areas. Um, you don't really need to memorize that. We're not going to use this that often, but you will have to use this in the homework. Try not to just look at the formula every time. Try to think about, okay, I know how to find an area based on you know, the base of a rectangle the height and then substitute into that. And then it's something that if you need to think of it a month from now, you'll remember how it works. Okay, so here's an example. Find the area enclosed by this curve and the y-axis. So take a minute. Um, if you want to, graph it on your calculator so you can get a visual representation of it. But take a minute and try to find that area. Okay, so here's what you should have ended up with. Um, I need to know my constraints here. So when you graph this, you'll notice that since we're enclosed by the y-axis, we have to figure out if we're enclosed by the y-axis, when is the x-coordinate going to be zero? So that's the one part that we didn't really talk about that you have to think through just a little bit. When is the x zero? It's at t is zero and t is two. And then from there, we know the height of each rectangle is going to be the y, the square root of t. And then to get my dx part of this, I just need to get my derivative and then multiply by dt. So I need dx dt, which is 2t minus 2 multiplied by dt. And then I've got this integral to set up. And then it just turns into stuff from calculus AB or BC to solve this integral out. And we end up with 8 fifteenths times the square root of 2. OK, so let's move on here to arc length. Arc length is very, very simple um, to do in parametric equations as well. It has the exact same derivation as what we used before. The only difference is if I want to figure out um, the arc length in parametric form, like you see down here in this box, if I want to set that up, really what I have to do is go back and think about when we did arc length, we broke um, our length into a bunch of small pieces. And using the Pythagorean theorem, we got the length of each one of those pieces, and we got it in terms of dx squared plus dy squared. If I were to modify this equation, what I can do is just multiply by dt over dt. So I'm multiplying essentially by 1. And when I move the dt and the denominator into this integral, what I'm going to end up with is dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. And that's my square root. And then I still have the dt as um, my differential expression there. So pretty easy to do. I'm just moving that dt into that radical um, into the, and it becomes part of the radicand um, to create the formula or the setup for arc length in parametric form.
So you can see down here, this is what the equation looks like. Very, very simple to use. Um, also very easy to derive, but this one's pretty easy to remember. We'll use this a lot when we get to three-dimensional parametric equations as well, and it's a very, very similar setup. So you'll use this enough, you'll probably remember it, but that is one of the things you will want to memorize just because in 3D, it's so similar to that. If you can get the 2D memorized, then the 3D will, will follow from that. So here's an example. Just take a minute and solve that one out. You might be able to do this one in your head. Okay, so here is the result of that one. You can see that inside the square root here, I've got sine squared plus cosine squared, which is one. So I'm essentially integrating a constant value of one. So it's just the length of the interval, which is two pi. And it makes sense because what we have is the graph of a circle and we're doing one rotation of the circle. So we're essentially finding the perimeter of a circle or the circumference. So two pi, it makes sense that that's the result that you get because if we go around the circle, that's all we got was the circumference. Okay, so last thing here is just surface area. And again, this is a topic we covered in Calculus BC. The main thing here with surface area is that we're breaking our surface into a bunch of bands of area. So this has a close correlation to arc length. We're taking a piece of that arc length, we're revolving it around whatever our axis of revolution is, to create that band of area, and then we're going to use an integral to add all those bands up. Okay, so here's the setup that we used before. And let me switch over to this one. Okay, so here's the um, setup we used before. We did the area of each band was the circumference times DL, where DL is a small piece of our arc length. And to find that, here's what we had. So we had 2 pi times the radius, and right here, two pi times my radius is like the circumference. We just factored the two pi out of the integral because it's a constant. And then the piece of the arc length is this part of it. Okay, so that's the way we did it um, in calculus BC when we were working in those standard rectangular coordinates. So now to do this in the parametric form, all we're gonna do is modify this expression. We already know how to do arc length. We just did that a second ago. So that expression we have with the square root of one plus F prime squared, we're just gonna substitute in for that. And that's gonna give me my new formula. And you can see that depending on which way we measure our radius, and that's gonna depend on which way our rotation goes, um, the radius is gonna be the distance from the axis. But notice the radical and the radicand doesn't change. So the only thing that changes is whether we're measuring the radius from the horizontal axis or from the vertical axis. But everything's gonna be in terms of T, so there's really not anything that you have to do other than know which, you know, know which way to measure the radius and then know how to find those derivatives and then it's just a matter of solving the integral. I will warn you that sometimes these integrals are a little bit messy. So if you run into one where it's starting to turn into a mess when you try to solve it, plug it into the calculator and get an approximation and that will be just fine. Okay, so there is an example down here and I just want you to try this. Find the area of the surface generated by revolving this given curve about the x-axis. And again, you might wanna graph it just to get a visual representation of what's actually happening here. But in terms of what we're going through, I'm just going through sort of the key steps and actually solving the problem out. Um, go ahead and set it up and solve it out and you can pause the video and then I'll put the solution up and just briefly go through that solution. Okay, so here's what you should have ended up with. Um, you can see that we've got to use the product rule here when we take our derivatives. And remember, we're getting dx dt and dy dt. A little bit messy. Um, and you can see the integral this time. It looks like a giant mess. It actually works out fairly nicely if you go through and um, you know expand everything out and factor out the e to the t and you can go through and you can actually get an exact solution for this but it's quite a bit of work. So in the end, um, what I would recommend you do on a problem like this is just plug it into the calculator. So if I were to ask you to work a problem like this and I asked you to show work, this is all I would really wanna see. I wanna see your derivatives, I wanna see the integral, and then from there, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're plugging it into a calculator unless you choose 
um, to take on the challenge of solving it out. And like I said, if you can see that there's an easy way to solve it, go ahead and solve it out by hand just to keep yourself um, practiced in those skills. But if it looks like it's a giant mess, plug it into the calculator. Okay, so that's all I have on this lesson. And um, make sure you work through the homework questions. And if you have questions on the lesson, next time at the beginning of class, we will have some time to talk about these topics.